Death is not a popular subject. In fact, most people would like to just ignore it until one of these days somewhere out there they have to face it in reality. Well, God certainly does not want us to be overshadowed by the very idea of the thoughts of death, but neither does He want us to ignore the whole idea for the simple reason that He says in His Word, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, that it is inescapable, there is no way to escape death unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes. It is inevitable in every person's life. So the question is this, are you ready to meet the Lord? How do you want to leave this life? What do you want to leave behind? And so people have different ideas about death. The Scripture makes it very clear that there are three types of death, three aspects of death. One of them is this, that is physical death, that is a separation of the spirit and the soul from the body. There is spiritual death, which is what God was speaking of when He spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, ye shall surely die. Spiritual death, a person's death toward the things of God. And then there is what the Bible calls the second death or eternal death, eternal separation from God. If you're a believer, then you'll never have to worry about eternal death. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're not spiritually dead. If you have not trusted Him as your personal Savior, you're spiritually dead. And likewise, you face eternal of the second death. So those things are just absolutely certain. Now, while He does not want us being totally concerned about death at all times or let it determine how we live out our life, the question is, well, how are we to feel about it? Well, certainly, if you really and truly believe what oftentimes we say we believe, the Word of God, then as a believer, you have no reason to fear death. If you're living in sin, then you've got some, some reasons to be thinking seriously about your lifestyle and meeting the Lord. If you are an unbeliever, that's the last thing that you want to happen to you, and that is to die without Christ. Well, you say, well, what about, how do we feel about our friends? Well, we have a right to grieve over our friends and to sorrow over our friends when they pass away. There's nothing about that that indicates a lack of faith. And grieving is a part of the whole process. And so, all of that is a part of living and dying and facing death. But the issue that I want us to deal with in this message is this, and that is the whole issue of how do we end well? People end life different ways. How do we end well? And I want to show you two things in these passages. Number one, how you do not end well. And then, what are the elements in a life that help a person and make a person possible to end well? So I want you to turn, first of all, to Luke chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 12, here is a perfect example of how a person lives their life, but do they... Do they end well? No, they do not. That is, from all outward perspectives, it looks like they're just doing fantastic. Plenty of this and plenty of that and plenty of the other. And yet, when it comes to dying, they don't end well. So I want us to look at this passage for a moment. And notice, if you will, beginning in uh, the 15th verse of this 12th chapter of Luke, the Scripture says, Then he said to them, Beware, and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Then the Scripture says, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build large ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man, or the woman, who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now think about this. There are many people who are going to live their life. You may be one of them. You're going to live all of your life and up to this point, this is how far you've come. Your life consists of many things, but you don't have a place for God in your life. So you've lived it out, and at this point, you don't even feel like you need Him because you've got plenty of money. 
You have friends. You have all the material possessions you want. You can go anywhere you want to go, do anything you want to do, be what you want to be. And so from all practical purposes and your thinking, why do you need God? Well, there are several answers to that question, but I want to show you the truth about living your life and being unprepared to die. Listen to what happens in the Scripture. The Scripture says, This man began to reason to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And what I want you to notice is that in this passage, I, me, my. I, me, my, I, me, my. And what I want you to notice is this, that he did his reasoning without God. He said, Now, uh, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Reasoning totally without God. No sense of the idea of the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of all things, but it appears as far as he's concerned that he is the one who is in control. He failed to recognize the very source of his wealth. What shall I do about my productive crops and my barns? I'm going to tear them down because I'm, I'm just going to have so much more, so much more grain, so much more that I don't even have room for them. No place, no understanding, no recognition of the source. Left God out of his plans altogether. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to live my life. And also very presumptuous about how long he was going to live. Notice what he said. This is what I'll do. Tear down my barns, build larger ones. There I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease and drink and be merry. And what? And he never asked the next question. What follows ease and making merry? Because, you see, he would not and did not consider the fact that one of these days he was going to have to meet God. So... The Scripture says something very interesting happens here. He's given himself, told over to materialism. He's greedy. He's self-centered. He says, what am I going to do about my barns and my crops and my this and my ease and my comfort, my pleasure? And you think about it. There are many people today who are living just like this man. They're living for themselves and themselves only. It's what they can achieve, what they can accomplish, what they can have. It's their ease, their comfort, their pleasure. It's their security. It's what they're able to handle. It's how they want to handle their life. It's how they want to live their life. It's all about them. And the fact that death is absolutely inevitable and making no plans for death and simply saying things like this, well, when I'm gone, I'm just gone. Sorry, that's not true. And oftentimes people have very distorted ideas about death. For example, people have the idea, I'm going to be annihilated. So that's going to be the end of me. Or somebody says, well, I guess I'll go to sleep and sleep for two or three thousand years or whatever it might be, and then I'll probably wake up in heaven. Or the idea, well, you know, sooner or later, we are all going to get there because God is a good God. And they go on and on and on with these ideas about death. Not a single one of them is Scripture. Somebody says, well, but the Bible says we can pray for the dead. My family will be praying for me. And if I go to somewhere to suffer, then I'll be out. No, you won't. There's not a single verse in this book that says you will. And the idea of praying for the dead, Paul mentioned that and saying the people who were doing that, he was sort of making fun of them because what they were really saying on the one hand didn't work at all. He never promoted the idea of praying for the dead. Once you die, that's it. It's fixed. This sec there's not a single verse in the Bible that says you have a second chance. So many people is warped distorted ideas about death. That's the reason they're living their lives totally wrapped up in themselves. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Not it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, after that, after hmm, 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 all these ideas that people have that are totally unscriptural. When you breathe your last breath, God calls you home, that's it. Think about this. For believers, we love the truth. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Not absent from the body, soul, sleep, annihilation, somebody pray for you. None of that is true. What you and I have to face is this. One of these days, we're going to die, and we're going to face the truth. And the truth is, we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord God. And he says that he has appointed a time, a moment in time, 
If you could take a calendar for the next 50 years or 75 or whatever it might be, at some point on that calendar, and at some point on the clock, and at some point on the stopwatch, God knows exactly when He's going to call us. How foolish to live this kind of life. So look at the consequences of living this life. So the Scripture says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you've prepared? Death struck him unexpectedly. How many people leave home every morning, go into work, and never come home? Get on airplanes, never come back to this ground. None of us knows the hour, the moment. We don't know. Would you not agree that it's foolish not to be prepared for something that is inevitable? And so people say, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to think about that. I'm young. I'm 18 years of age. Don't talk to me about death. You better listen carefully. A lot of your friends have already died and will die. I'm in my 20s, and I've got my whole life in front of me. Well, you know, I'm in good health, and uh, that's for those weak Christians who are afraid of death, and I'm not afraid because I just believe that somehow everything is going to be all right. Everything is not going to be all right, and this is why the Scripture is here. This is a warning from the Lord Jesus Christ to say to us, a person who lives their life for materialistic purposes and gains and only seeking pleasure in life, one to satisfy the desires of their life. No relationship to God, no account of God, no belief in God except some hazy, self-imposed kind of belief that is totally unscriptural. Here's what he says. He says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Now, here's what makes this so serious. When God calls a person a fool, it's all over. It's all over. No matter what you have in this life, no matter who you know and who you fraternize with and what your position and how much wealth you have and how much recognition and all the rest, when the last breath comes and God calls you, that's it. And he said to this person, to this man, you have all of this? Who are you going to leave it to? Because you're gone. This night your soul is required of you. At some point on that calendar, on that clock, on that timepiece, at some point on there, here's what he says. Your soul is required of you. We're going to have to give an account to God. And putting it off and saying, I don't believe any of that, does not change one single thing. So think about this. The consequences of this is that God called him unexpectedly to call him to give an account. He died without God. There is no excuse. There is nothing left. And if you'll remember, for example, in the 16th chapter of Luke, when Jesus once again, he's not talking about a parable. This is something he saw, he knew. He said, this rich man died, Lazarus, the poor man. When he died, the angels took him to heaven. The Bible says of the rich man, it wasn't his riches. It was the fact there's no place for God in his life. He died and was buried. And the next phrase says, and in torment. You may have some funny belief about God, but here's the true serious belief. Absent from the body, present with the Lord for believers. Absent from the body for unbelievers, present in torment. That's why God says a person is a fool. To know the truth, to hear the truth, and then to put it off, to ignore it as if it's not going to happen. Death is inevitable, it is inescapable, but the believer does not have to be afraid of death. We do not have to be afraid of death when he says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You say, well, now it's that time between uh, my dying, uh, that time between um, uh, that time when I, 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 I breathe my last breath, and uh, what, about, what about that time? What time are you talking about? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. How fast do you think that'll be? Whew. Faster than that. Why? Because time is not an issue with God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So he says one way to live your life out and to end it is to end it having God called you a fool because you lived your life without him. So I want to ask you this question.